You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Tracy Murda with the Future Tech Podcast. On this episode of Future Tech Podcast, we host Matt Moody, the CEO and founder of Bellwether, a machine learning and artificial intelligence software platform designed to help your businesses of all sites retain their recurring revenue. Wow, that's a mouthful. Welcome, Matt. Thanks so much for joining me this morning. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And where are you at this morning? In the city. Okay. Okay. Getting ready for that Thanksgiving uh, holiday coming up? Yeah, trying to get as much done as I can before then. <laughs> well, usually holiday weeks, everyone is like, absolutely MIA come the Monday of that week. And I'm not finding that to be true this year as much as I want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, why don't we jump in? I want to talk. Well, first, I'm very curious. Where did the name of the company come from? Okay, so I mean, the definition, obviously, you know, we have to be very techy and not spell it correctly. You know, we have to drop a vowel. Of course, um, absolutely. But, uh, but the, you know, the, we really kind of took it from the, just, you know, sort of the definition of Bella there being a predictor. And um, I, I liked that at the very beginning, um, you know, as far as like being indicative of what's likely to happen. And now we're, you know, we've evolved a little bit from, originally, that's really what we did was sort of offer sort of a prediction, uh, sort of simple predictions on customer retention. And we've since expanded on that, but that, you know, it's essentially what we're still doing. We're predicting sort of which actions work best in which scenarios. Um, and and so that's, that's yeah, I, that's where it all came from. Now, you've been around since what, about 2017? Yeah, yeah, correct. Okay. Tell me about where this started. What, why did this become important to you? Um, <clears throat> So, uh, Bo, well, there's the the fourth startup that I founded, and when uh, the last startup that I founded was acquired by a regional telecommunications company, and when I was there, I ran their digital operations and uh, built uh, some machine learning models. One in particular that that predicted which customers were at risk of leaving. And so, um, at the point when I invested, um, everybody pretty well knew I was going to leave and start something else. And so, uh, that company came on as customer number one. Uh, which was a great way to start Bellwether. And, and really, my idea was just to kind of spread that. I saw the value that it delivered. And, and so I felt like, hey, this is a great place to start. And um, that was, I mean, that was really the the origin behind it is I felt like a lot of the machine learning tools that were out there were were just incredibly complex and, and very open-ended. And so I felt like, hey, you know, I, I mean, I guess at the very beginning, it was mostly like, hey, I think this is kind of a cool thing that I could provide and deliver value to a bunch of this. And and then the next step, when I decided that I thought maybe I was onto something bigger, I felt like I'd figure out a different way to, to build and deploy machine learning models uh, rapidly. And and that, I felt like, was a, a considerable value because, I mean, even today, it's still challenging to to not just build machine learning models, which has become simpler, but, but deploying mm-hmm. them and making them um, to actually deliver a value to a business, that that's still fairly challenging. Um, and 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 it's such a powerful technology that I think w- the more challenging it is to actually put it into use, then it, you know it's delivering a value to fewer businesses, uh, typically you know still in the hands of large organizations only. Um, and and it's just it's only empowering uh, a, you know, a limited number of people. So for the laypersons out there like myself, um, break it down for me and tell me what exactly is that you in providing for your customer base and. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what we're talking about, but. 
Um, yeah, sure. So uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of difference in kind of like what we do because there's, you know, we're yeah. not just we're not just providing just machine learning. Um, mm-hmm. So what we call it is intelligent automation. The idea is that there there was another step. One of the things that we learned along the way was <clears throat> that we, you know, a lot of uh, business intelligence tools or analytics are very much, you know, providing information and information only. And information is great, uh, but with if you only have information, it, it isn't going to change anything. And so that was one of the things that we realized was that we were providing these insights and saying, okay, hey, here's some, here's a, you know, here's here are your customers that are at risk. Um, but when we went back and said, you know, okay, now uh, to you know, we talked to our customers, we'd say, you know, okay, what are you doing with it? And yet, you know, we heard a lot of crickets, like, well, not sure, or you know, we just we're, we're just doing something that's very rudimentary. We're doing one thing, mm-hmm. and so. Really, what we decided was, well, okay, the idea behind this, you know, what's really, what we're really after here is the ability to make this, it, we're trying to automate this and, and trying to automate things in a very smart way. And so what we did is we use a, we use a different form of machine learning that is reinforcement learning. And um, basically what it does is it takes sort of, you know, finds a pattern in data in in context, and it basically figures out for that scenario, which, you know, it, like then it looks at all available actions that are, you know, on the table. And, and what it will do is say for which scenario, uh, which action should be taken in, in this particular scenario that's most likely to get us to positive outcomes. So, for example, one of our tools uh, is called Retention Engine. And the idea is that when a customer, it, so it's focused on a specific event, when a customer clicks the cancel button. And the idea is when they click that cancel button, what should happen? What what should it, what what should the business do at that point that is uh, for that specific customer and is most likely to result in a positive outcome, being the customer's problem is resolved and they 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 remain a customer. So um, in that, that's really what is happening behind the scenes is it's, it's finding patterns that are associated with actions and outcomes. And okay. it learns with each new experience. We call you know each one of them is, is essentially experience. Um, and so what we are doing is we're applying this the technology itself to different points in the customer lifecycle, different events. So we have obviously the one I just mentioned, which is um, trying to retain customers at the point of cancellation. We have um, another one that tries to figure out what to do to get customers that are on a free tier or a free trial up to a paying. Um, and then we also have another another one that is focused on winning back customers who who went through and canceled but weren't retained. So the idea is, what can we do now to win these customers mm-hmm. back? And um, so yeah, that's 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 in a sense what you know what we do. And then we have uh, a range of different. Um, they're very open ended. We call them vanilla, and they you know the business can come up with all of the other events that they may have in their process. And it basically will figure out what to do in which scenario, learn from the positives and the negatives, and it's sort of like autopilot for uh, improving the customer experience. So who are your customers? What industries do you work in? I mean, obviously, you don't mm. name specific names, but yeah. who are you helping? Yeah, yeah. so it's pretty broad, um, unfortunately, uh, just because the answer is like, you know, whenever we talk to anybody and they ask, you know, hey, can I do this? And the answer is always yes. Yeah, yeah. I could probably do that. Um, figure it out. But we, we yeah, exactly. It'll it'll figure it out. Um, <clears throat> the really sort of our bread and butter is uh, recurring billing. So we do like subscription commerce. Um, that can be anything from digital subscriptions to um, subscription boxes. And then we also have you know sort of ongoing relationships. So we work with uh, banks and financial organizations. Okay. Now, when you have clients who are you know coming on board, signing up. Are they generally, is it an all-in-one package? Like here, you get the retention, you get the win-back engine, all of those things. Or do you see that they maybe do more of an all-the-cart selection, I guess, based on their needs? And how do they know what their needs are? Yeah, so they, I mean, we typically will have, so we call like the win-back engine, retention engine, and um, and the upsell engine. Um, mm-hmm. All of those are sort of our packaged up. We've packaged them up that way. They're, you know, there's a, there's a, it, it's very easy to explain, and everybody knows exactly what's coming in that, in, you know, in that box. And then, really, that we see that as sort of like a starter point because ultimately, we we think that you know you can plug this into virtually every single event or uh, element of of a customer's experience. And so, 
um, really we'll get it, you know, usually we start with one of those prepackaged ones and then they can kind of see, oh, okay, this is how this works. Okay, here's the ROI now. And then, and then sort of the ideas start to flow of like, oh, well, hey, what about, you know, sort of like uh, we have another one that uh, it is not a prepackaged one, but one of our customers had, they, they came up with the idea of using it for uh, uh, first impression. They call it a first impression engine. Mm-hmm. And the idea is, you know, right when a customer comes on board, maybe there's additional things that they could do, like um, send them a box of cookies. And, you know, and, and basically what will end up happening is that our engine figures out in which scenario that should be the trigger. Versus maybe it's, you know, some other, you know, a, an email about something else that's going on or, you know, something along those lines. And, and it basically will measure the, and, and improve, it really optimizes based on the outcomes from that. Like, hey, maybe the customer, you know, uh, signed in again or uh, made an additional deposit or, or bought something additional, something along those lines. Or they had a higher, maybe, maybe they had a higher NPS score. Okay. That makes sense. All right. Why is this? I don't know, what are, what are you finding is the reason that the automated learning, machine learning, why is it so popular right now or why is it so critical? I think for, I mean, I personally think for businesses to be successful in that customer retention. I mean, you have, you know, I, I've worked for companies where they just throw customers away, recycle them. It's like, nope, we'll just pick up a new one, pick up a new one, pick up a new one, no big deal. Um, and then you have other companies who obviously understand that important. Where do you think this fits in or why is it a trend right now as far as the AI learning? Well, I, I think the big one is that um, as this, this, I mean, essentially does, I always kind of look at it as that this plays to the strengths of what the computer does best is, is in sort of the process mm-hmm. and in uh, creating sort of the, the ideal process. And what it really does is it, it then puts the, it, it sort of empowers the, the, the human element to focus on the creative, which is still a vastly superior, you know, we're, we're, humans are way better at the creative side. Um, now, you know, whether or not that's the case in the long run, but right now, I mean, it's like, that's, that's the side where we thrive and, you know, figuring out what to do when and really coming up with the decisions, that's more of a mathematical thing. And so lends itself to artificial intelligence or machine learning. Um, and, and really, I mean, I think most of the time, I, I you know, what I, I, I've enjoyed some of the things that we've used, you know, we eat our own dog food. And so there's some things where I'm like, okay, now I get to come up with, I, I can actually sit down and come up with ideas and which is my favorite part is coming up with the different right. ideas. And then sort of the implementation or the like, hey, you know, uh, sort of like run the experiment and figure out what works and which ones are crappy and which ones are good. Um, the system figures that out and I don't have to. So I can, it, it sort of enables me just to focus on the creative, which I think is it is really sort of the next paradigm shift into, in, in where I guess we see everything kind of moving is, you know, back to, back to more creative sort of work. Why isn't everybody doing this? I mean, <laughs> it's probably your ideal uh, dream in question, but I mean, it just seems like <laughs> such common sense that, you know, it, it takes a lot off of a business to have to, to figure this stuff out when, you know, you guys can do it for them. What, is, what are folks um, looking or not understanding? Is it the technology? Yeah, I think it's it, because it's a little, you know, we've, we've kind of gone through these different um, sort of shifts. I mean, for the longest time we have, yeah, you know, there's so many tools that are out there for analytics, and it's like, oh well, I want to, I want to look at the analytics on this, or I, I need to, you know, build a graph that looks into this. Um, and I think that's 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 pretty normal because it's like, oh hey, look, we can actually do this now. We can look at all these, you know, we can look at all this data, and well, there's so much information here. First, it's it makes sense to kind of do it manually, which I look at is like business intelligence and analytics is sort of like the manual, like okay, let me look at it, let me let me try to understand it, and then, it, and that's still kind of where we're at, I think. You know, for the most part, mm-hmm. it's still like, hey, we're going to hire some data scientists or data analysts, and we're going to spend all that time crunching the numbers and, and, and trying to see where we can pick up information. And really, the next iteration of that is to just automate that. And, and instead of just having a bunch of charts, which then require somebody to constantly update them, you know, because there's new data coming in. And then most importantly, somebody has to go do something about it. Um, we use the analogy that you know, what we were kind of doing originally where we were showing like a score, you know, we were showing an insight into customers, the risk of leaving. We, we kind of look at that as like, hey, we were pointing out the front door was open. Um, it, you know, that's that's what a lot of business intelligence tools are doing. It's like, okay, hey, there you go. There's the information that's now that front. Now that door is not going to close unless somebody does something about it. It's going to remain open. It's just information about what's going on. It isn't 
it doesn't change the scenario at all. And so I think it, I think it's just largely the fact that you know getting your head wrapped around like I don't need to really go look at all these charts. I can you know if, if I if I think about the outcome that I want, then then I can I can create a program that will discover what what should be done that 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 increases the likelihood of, of the positive outcome that I'm shooting for. Sure. So tell me about some of the, the recent performance stats that you've been getting back. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the retention engine tool, which I, I mentioned earlier, is the one that, that uh, kind of discovers what to do. Or well, and it, and it does, you know, it takes the actions when somebody clicks cancel. Um, the, so right now across all of our customers, which is, you know, across industry, um, we're increasing their their retention rates by 28.9% on average and 20.5% within the first seven days. So I think that's another important stat that, you know, a lot of times when you make an investment in some deeper technology, a lot of times it's like, okay, well, the payoff isn't going to be for, you know, we won't know for sure if it's returning for six months to a year mm-hmm. or something like that. And, and that's one of the things that I think is is really powerful about, you know, sort of uh, the the automation element of this is that ours is, you know, showing positive results and positive ROI within, you know, a week. That's huge. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that alone, I would say, is, oh, my gosh, that's extremely worth it versus doing your old old school research yes. method. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, mean, I can't even believe I'm saying this, but we're at the end of the year here soon. So what is, is coming up for Bellwether for 2020? Um, I, you know, the big one for us is going to be building out, you know, more integrations with different platforms, you know, different CRMs, different billing providers. Um, that way we can, you know, truly make sure that, you know, we have, we have the ability to automate as many processes, as many um, outcomes as possible. And so that's, that's the big one for us. And then, um, you know, we're adding some additional uh, prepackaged versions of these. That way, you know, I think the, the big one for us is like once we can get in the door and kind of show value with something that's very explainable and everybody and very straightforward, then, mm-hmm. then you know, the real power for us is when the, the people who have the domain knowledge, they really understand their business and the problems that they solve and their customers, then they're going to know like, hey, what about this process? You know, what 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 it could, you know, could we apply it to X, Y, and Z? Um, and so I think that's, that's really kind of where we want to get is to the point where then it's sort of self-serve and they can come up with all of the different engines that they want um, and plug them in and automate, you know, as many of these processes as possible. Excellent. Well, is there anything else that we should know as, you know, potential consumers um, as far as Bellwether goes, how do we sign up? How do we get started? What do you, what information do you need from, you know, potential customers or clients to, you know, give them an idea of, is this going to work for me? Yeah. Yeah. So typically, I mean, you bellwether.com it's okay, obviously, you know, it's got to be spelled weird, of course, uh, but B-E-L-L-W-E-T-H-R, no, no E-R, just T-H-R.com. And um, and from there, then they can book a demo with one of our one of our executives or one of our uh, automation executives, and and they'll kind of walk them walk them through. We always try to, you know, I, I think it's still sort of since it's just a little sort of a different idea and a different way to look at things. Um, that's that's where we started. We always want to walk everybody through and kind of show them. Not only they understand what it does do, what it doesn't do, um, so everybody's sort of on the same page. Awesome. Well, Matt, I sure appreciate you joining me today. I know you're a busy guy, and I just wish you a, a fantastic holiday week here. And you too. Keep us posted on, on what's coming up with Bellwether and, you know, what where we go from here. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, 
please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.